Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Avemco Pilot Talk webinar series. I am Gene Benson, and I will be shifting roles for this presentation and serving as your host. We have a terrific presenter for you today. I will introduce her shortly, but first, just a bit of housekeeping. We always begin live seminars where pointing, uh, by pointing out the exits in case of emergency. In this case, I'm going to leave it up to you to figure out an emergency exit plan for wherever you are. Our emergency would be some sort of a system crash on my end. It's unlikely, but if it does happen, check your email or check vectorsforsafety.com for information on when we will try again. Your attendance at this event may qualify you to earn the Basic Knowledge 3 plus the Advanced Knowledge 2 FAA Wings credit. Now to be eligible, uh, you must be logged in for most of the session and participate in most of the polls. Now your poll response doesn't matter, they're not graded questions or anything. It just is used to prove that you are participating and that you weren't just logged in. Uh, now sorting the data and issuing the credit is a bit uh, time consuming, so please allow up to seven days uh, for your credit to, uh, to show up. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Kim Skipper. Kim is a chartered property casual underwriter, and she is the aviation underwriting manager at Avemco Insurance. Since 1987, Kim has been forming relationships and friendships with Avemco Insurance Company customers. She says, I love the fact that my experience, combined with being a direct underwriter, allows me to deliver immediate answers to the customers. Part of Kim's responsibilities is to monitor accident and incident file claims. Uh, so with that, we will do a positive exchange of flight controls and say, Kim, you have the controls, and I am going to click here and make Kim, Kim the presenter. And all right, Kim, we're not seeing your screen. You need to, there we go. Just uh, go into the presentation mode, if you would. There we go. All, All right. right, Kim, you have it. I'm going All to turn right. my webcam off, and uh, I can turn yours off as well if you like. If I can find it, I can, and there we go. Everybody should see the full screen presentation now. Thank you, Kim. All okay. yours. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us tonight to talk about birds, bullets, and bears. Um, First, just a quick on who we are. Um, obviously, you can read the screen there to see it, see a little bit about us. Um, what we're presenting here is Avemco's claim data. This is not uh, reflect what you may see in the NTSB data re reports or the FAA reports. Um, one of the interesting things to point out is tell us tell you a little bit about us. Um, our first policy was issued in 1961, ensuring a Cessna 172. About three months later, we had our very first claim, and yes, you guessed it, it was on our very first 172. Um, our A-plus rating means that AMBEST has audited our financials and has given us a superior rating, which means we have the ability to pay all our current claims and our anticipated future claims and keep operating without any additional problems. So let's go move on to the more fun and interesting topics of discussion tonight. Uh, this is the bird strike we all fear. This was a Blanca 70 CA. The windscreen uh, was hit. It was in day VFR conditions. The bird, we didn't know what kind of bird it was. Uh, the pilot mentioned he was glad he was wearing glasses. We do see a lot of these. And in fact, one of the claim falls uh, the customer had actually mentioned he was amazed at the amount of drag um, because of that hole in the damaged wing, windscreen. And in both these instances, the airplane obviously was able to land without incident. The bird, maybe not so much. This one here is a goose strike. The pilot reported seeing two birds. He changed the course of action to miss them. Um, however, we're not sure that the birds took the evasive action. One missed the plane, and the other, as you can see, impacted the wing. The aircraft again landed safely and was repaired. The goose probably didn't uh, land quite so safely. And we have another one here, uh, also a goose strike on a Cessna 172. And in this case, uh, we were lucky in that the plane didn't, the goose didn't hit the prop, uh, just the cow. 
So it was a relatively quick repair and the airplane wasn't grounded too long. Uh, this one occurred in the Anchorage, Alaska area. And this is a, another picture from the Alaska area, and it's definitely showing bad form as there really should be a pilot or a trained person at the controls during the hand propping procedure. <laughs> Moving on, this is damage and deflation of a tire related basically to bears. This was also in Alaska, and fortunately the plane owner had a lot of patches with them and a tire pump. Uh, the fix was good enough for one takeoff and one landing required to get the plane out of the bush country and back to the airport to be repaired. Uh, the previous slide we was uh, in Merrill Field. That had a higher percentage over of, of these type of claims than in the lower 48. And in fact, over the night of June 1st and 2nd in 2016, tires were slashed on 87 airplanes at Merrill Field and the damage was discovered 6-2. Here is one of the tires uh, that was damaged at Merrill Field. Uh, we know this was a moose claim and it happened in Alaska. The plane is based on a neighborhood one runway and one evening when a neighbor was coming home, they saw the moose engaged with the plane. They did the neighborly thing, which was to shoo the moose away and then informed their neighbor they had a better thoroughly check their plane before their next flight. And this next one is a deer strike that occurred during takeoff run. The pilot was able to abort the takeoff and the plane remained on the runway. And as an insurance person, I am happy to see the blue stains on the wing because we see a surprising number of fuel exhaustion claims every year. Most of, our, most of our cow claims are reported after someone has landed in a field or a pasture and left their plane overnight. Uh, cows seem to be attracted to aircraft as a preferred back scratcher. But in this instance, the cow was a little, claim was a little bit unusual in that it escaped from the field, wandered into the open hangar, and then managed to damage the airplane. Everyone is always interested in animal-related claims, but I don't think this is what they would qualify as animal-related. The statistics do surprise a lot of people because of the relatively no, low numbers, and you can see that we do see a higher frequency of animals in Alaska than in the lower 48. And Gene, I think you wanted to jump in here for a poll. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Here's our first poll of the of the day. Just please choose one of those. Again, uh, you know, you're not graded on your answer here. <laughs> Just trying to get a feeling for uh, how this all works. What is the best way to uh, to reach people? And we will uh, do a few more minutes here. This tells me how many people have made a selection. 83% have now made a selection. We'll let it go, 86, 87, 88, 89, it's going down. Remember, you need to participate in the polls to get wings credit, 91%. Okay, it seems to be stopped there, 92. All right, we'll give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And the poll is closed, and we can just share that and let you see what we got here. 87%. Get it from those SPANS emails and and uh, very, <laughs> wow, not even close on any of the other uh, the other medias. All right. All right. Well, thank you for your participation in that. All right, Kim, back to you. Okay. This next uh, slide is showing a 172, and this was actually a gunshot to the rudder. Uh, we do see that frequently. This next slide is interesting in that it shows uh, basically tornado damage. Uh, what made this claim a little bit more interesting than the run-of-the-mill tornado type claim is that the aircraft in the hangar, which is marked in, in yellow, the yellow arrow, was damaged. 
Uh, that person apparently did not have an insurance. Our, co our customer had the hanger that is marked with the red arrow. The other injured in entity claimed that it was the debris from his hangar that caused the damage to his airplane and not the tornado. Uh, we did go in and, and defend our customer, and since there was no negligence on the part of our customer, we didn't, uh, didn't have to pay and neither did our customer. But we do see that uh, frequently. Here's another picture of a 172 where the cabin is twisted at the main landing gear. Uh, this is also as a result of a tornado. Uh, this is uh, one of the recent torn or hurricanes that went through in Louisiana this past summer. Uh, as you can see, there's at least three airplanes there that are damaged. And unfortunately, we do see we do see a lot of those. Uh, this next one does show uh, hail damage. And again, another frequent claim that we see. It's not unusual to see several of them in any given month. And and we do uh, have had instances where we've actually had a total on airplane uh, because of that. This next picture is flood damage, um, more than likely after a tropical storm or hurricane. And in most cases, in, in these instances, that ends up totaling the airplane because of the inundation of the, the brackish and saltwater incenses. And to wrap up on the weather side, um, this number surprises a lot of people that in that out of 100 claims that we see on a yearly basis, at least 18 of them are due to weather. And when we talk about weather claims, these are ones that don't involve flight or movement of the airplane. They're basically just wind, hail, snow, flood, hurricane, and tornado. Um, and these weather losses apply to both hangar and airplanes that are tied out. A tow bar. In general aviation, what do you think the average cost of a tow bar is? Well, it, the insurance answer is it depends on whether or not you remember to remove it before you start the engine. Um, in this case, uh, the tow bar was left on, the engine was started, and it was a $10,000 repair. Um, we see cases where the propeller struck the tow bar as soon as the engine was started, and we've seen them where they're actually taxiing and or in the, the mode getting ready to take off before that prop actually is struck by the tow bar. Um, my best recommendation would be if it isn't in your hand, it should be in the hangar or secured in the plane before you start up. Uh, most common cause of a prop strike related to the tow bar is distraction. Uh, the pilot reports getting distracted during their pre-flight. They think they've done it and they move on. And as they hear the sound of it hitting the prop, they realized, unfortunately, they forgot to do it. And in fact, the very last claim I looked at before coming in here today was at this exact situation. The tow bar was left on, the engine was started, and it uh, did manage to hit the prop. This next claim is a taxi-related claim, and a lot of them do involve taxiing and hitting something on the ramp. Uh, this one was caused by hitting a rubber safety cone. Um, and in fact, I had another one of these uh, last week as well. Um, another example of objects that aircraft can hit are hangers. Distracted taxiing is the leading cause of this. Uh, copying a clearance, setting up the avionics, reading the checklist, uh, the CFI pointing something out to the client, and both of them have their heads down in the cockpit. I, I see, I would say, at least one of these, if not more, a month, and it, it's the distractions. So if you can help minimize your distractions while you're taxiing, you may not uh, have to call me and report that you've done this to your prop. Kim, could I jump in there in just a second? Of course, before you leave the please prop? do. Uh, the taxi, I think this is the taxi accident, too. 
I yeah, always sure. uh, insisted that my students, whenever on the ground, kept one hand on the throttle and the other hand on the yoke or the stick, depending on what kind of airplane it was. And by doing that, not only did they have a hand on the throttle that they could, you know, close the throttle very quickly if something, if, if need be, but also that prevented them from running a checklist or tuning a radio or doing anything else. They just had to have it on there. And um, I've always thought that was a pretty good idea to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this next uh, slide shows the results of an improper hand propping of a Cessna 182. The battery was too drained to crank the engine. The pilot kept adding throttle, and each time the engine wouldn't start until it finally did. And when it did, it started with enough power to accelerate the plane into the hangar on the other side of the taxiway. And Can I jump and in I again on that one? Uh, oh, go ahead. Was, I'm sorry. I was getting ready to say, I believe you wanted to oh, yes. have a discussion yeah. about that, so please jump in. Um, some people say I have no life, but I do read every single accident report <laughs> that happens in the United States, and there's so many of them involve hand propping. Um, one that really bothers me a lot, it still bothers me after all these years, I think it happened in 2012 in Texas. It was three days after Christmas, uh, December 28th, and a man decided he was going to take his six-year-old granddaughter for a ride in his Cessna 150. He tried a couple times, and there wasn't enough battery there to, to uh, start the engine. So he got out, and his statement to the FAA was that he was just pulling the, the prop through. Well, I don't know if he left the key, you know, the switch on both, or if a P-lead was bad or something, but the engine started with the throttle pretty far advanced. And... He tried to grab the airplane as it went by him, and he was injured by that, but the airplane actually went across the ramp and became airborne with his six-year-old granddaughter strapped in the right seat. It went over a tree line and then crashed into some other trees, and she was uh, very seriously injured in that. And, you know, it, it just isn't worth it, uh, the hand propping. Have somebody qualified at the controls, and if that isn't possible, tie the airplane down and get it started. I've got to run for a little bit and, you know, then, then deal with it. But... And I never like getting out of an airplane with the engine running either. So the other issue on the low battery at start, as we get more and more electronics in our airplanes, um, we have to be very careful of a battery not being fully charged, particularly if you have a retractable gear airplane. Most of the retractable gear airplanes out there have an electro-hydraulic retract mechanism. It's an electric motor that runs a hydraulic pump to bring the gear up. Well, that takes a tremendous electrical load. Now, the alternator probably can't keep up with that by itself. It relies on the battery and then the alternator, you know, as a, as a supplement there. But if the battery is low, the alternator can't keep up with that. You can trip off uh, everything, lose all your electronics. I know different airplanes are rigged differently, but in some airplanes, you're going to lose everything. And um, now your gear is unlocked. It's not all the way up. You're, everything else has just gone out. Your glass panel is now dark. Um, and if you're going into IFR conditions, that, that would be a really, really bad day. So um, as we get more and more electronics in the airplane, the more important it becomes to have a good battery. And if you have to get out and hand prop it, you probably should be getting somebody to charge the battery and not hand propping the airplane. Anyway, that's enough of that soapbox. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. <laughs> They're very good points, and, you know, every little bit that you can do to help reduce your instance of claims helps everyone, you know, across the board. Moving on, that's a picture of the hanger getting hit by hand propping. Hangers frequently become a problem. Um, we see a lot of claims, I would say at least one or two of these a month, where the customers put the airplane in and dinged it. Uh, this first picture shows uh, basically, uh, sorry, this is an instance where they reported it as vandalism initially, but when the adjuster was in the hangar, he noticed that there was damage to the airplane that matched the dent and the paint color of a metal cabinet that was sitting in the back corner of the hangar. Uh, the advice there is before you turn your hangar into a combination hangar and storage facility, make sure you do have enough room in there for the airplane. Um, and also, if you're using chocks or blocks, 
make sure you recheck their position unless they're fastened to the floor because every time you bump them with a tire, they are going to move. And where you thought the plane is going to sit isn't. Uh, we see that frequently. The second picture shows basically the indents of a hangar door into the side of a 206. And this is a magic number that we, we like to put out. And this is the number of days from the last instruction to a landing accident. Um, so basically what we want to impress upon people is that the more you're with a CFI and the more training you occur and do, typically you, you're going to reduce the likelihood. You know, don't just go every two years for that flight review, as this number suggests, that not long after a year, you could uh, pr potentially have that problem. Um, and it's even more prevalent uh, this time, this year, due just to the overall COVID situation. We are seeing a lot more incidents of just more or less, I wouldn't say carelessness, but it's just a lack of skill, a lack of proficiency. Um, so you need to ask yourself, am I above average, am I below average, or have I been lucky? And then good news, as uh, Jean mentioned, this qualifies you with Avemco for 5% off your premium for the Safety Rewards Program. Moving onward, um, just to point out, uh, Avemco is the sponsor of the Wings Pins, and we actually have been the ones sending them out. And then, Jean, on behalf of Avemco, I want to thank you for hosting these trainings. It's people like you that make a difference in general aviation safety. Oh, thank you, Kim. I, uh, some of you, a lot of you have been on my webinars before, and you've heard the story of how I got into the accident work since we were kind of ahead of schedule here. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Starting in uh, uh, the year 2000, I had, no, ending in, no, anyway, around the year 2000, I had five friends who were involved in serious uh, aircraft accidents. All experienced pilots. I knew them all. I, I had a lot of faith in all of them. And four of them died in their accidents. One of them had life-changing injuries. Uh, four of them were professional pilots. The one who had life-changing injuries had a different profession, but uh, he was a flight instructor and in, uh, in double I, and his accident happened while he was giving uh, tailwheel instruction, a tailwheel airplane. Um, so I decided, you know, there's something, something wrong here, something going on when we have experienced pilots. And that was how I got into the human factors, uh, trying to figure out why do people make make bad decisions and error reduction has really been been kind of my thing but you know it happens and sometimes you have to hap have see it happen close to you before you realize that hey you know what that could be me I mean the the mistakes that my friends made I could have made those mistakes <laughs> you know what I, I'm no superman but if the more we learn and the more we're determined to continue learning on a regular basis uh, and then put it into practice, the less likely we are, we are of having a, a serious accident. And what, what drives me crazy is I got into accident uh, studies and studying the accidents, and you know what drives me crazy more than the pilots uh, having accidents getting killed? It's the passengers. Or it drives me especially crazy when somebody crashes into someone's house and injures somebody, you know, in their in their home that's just sitting there watching their TV or something. So. Um, that's why I got into this this work, and and if you look at accidents, you'll see that wow, you know, it can happen to all of us if we're if we're just not really, really, really careful. All right, off that soapbox too. <laughs> were you? Um, uh, are we ready for to do another uh, another poll? Yep, yeah, let's go with another poll. And here it is. What is your preferred method of earning wings credit? Oh, people are thinking a little more about this one. We're only at over 18%, 25%. Now it's coming up. We woke everybody up. Here we go. 66%. Numbers are climbing. Okay. 83%. 85%. 84%.
time to make your selection before we close this out. You seem to be hung up at 87%. Okay, we're going to close this poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It's closed. And there are the results. Live webinars with no quiz. Hey, um, Kim, I think we're I think we're doing a good job tonight. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. We're giving them wonder, what they want. <laughs> if if it wasn't for a if it wasn't for the pandemic, I wonder if uh, the numbers would be different in turning live on-site presentations. I don't know. Anyway. All right. Thank you all for that. All right, Kim, it's back to you. Okay. I believe we oh, are moving on. I didn't questions. even see where we were there. I'm sorry. We're back That's to all right. All right. With that, I am, we're going to change presenters, and I'm going to take the controls again. And there we go. I have the controls. All right. All right. Let me uh, look at look at some of these questions here. There are a lot of them. There are a ton of them. Great. And some are just a just a comment and saying welcome and saying hi and things like that. And they they're on about a two point font. So bear with these old eyes of mine. We we'll get on through here. Some are saying where they were from. Uh, somebody said their audio wasn't working, and then they responded, "Now it is working. That's good to know." Um, uh, oh, somebody's concerned that they're not going to get Wings credit because they're using their personal email. If that, you know, that that happens a lot. Um, just send me an email, uh, gene at genebenson.com, and tell me, you know, what email you're registered with and what email you're, you use on safety.gov, and I'll, I'll fix that. Uh, okay, okay, here's a good one, Kim. This regards the picture of the bear in front of the airplane. Um, is that polar bear doing a pre-flight inspection on that prop or just looking at a bird's nest? <laughs> And I, I'm not 100 percent sure on that one. <laughs> could be. It is Alaska. Yeah. It is Alaska. It is we Alaska, just, right? Anything happened yeah. in Alaska? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. All right. If you were a if you were a pilot, Kim, somebody was trying to uh, admonish you here. Said Kim never acknowledged I have the controls. <laughs> that oh, um, I well, thought I said, <laughs> but yeah, you're sure, right. That's okay. When um, that's a that's a big that actually should be a really big thing. When there are more accidents than you would think that either two people were trying to fly the airplane or nobody was trying to fly the airplane, <laughs> and uh, neither one of those is a really good situation. You know, flip a coin or do something, but uh, yeah. always know who's flying the airplane. All right, let's see. Still going down through here. Oops, bear with me here. Uh, oh, another one more about wings credit. Um, here we go. Is it true that birds will usually fly downwards when being approached by an airplane? So it may be best to ascend when seeing a bird, question mark. Hmm. Any uh, response to that, Kim? Um, that is outside my area of expertise okay. as to how birds fly. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that, that's from, from Sean. Um, I, I have read that also, uh, Sean. I, I cannot attest to that. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't bet on it, but um, I've, I've read it a couple of times, so maybe there's something to it. I guess at least if you uh, pull up, climb, <laughs> you may have a little chance of missing them, or at least you're going slower when you hit them. I don't know. Um, birds and airplanes don't mix, uh, as we can ask Captain Sonberger about. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I have Correct. never, I, I have had, I have only had minimal bird strikes over my career. I've had, um, you know, the small birds that put a little bit of a dent in the wing of something, um, nothing nothing serious, never took one in the windshield. I have, um, you know, I've come, I have come close a couple of times, but um, not so much. Um, one of my airplanes, when I ran a flight school, had a snake strike. Did you ever hear of a snake strike in flight? That, that's a new one to me. Yeah, no damage. Yeah. Uh, well, they didn't know it. Uh, it was a Beechcraft Duchess uh, multi-engine, and uh, they were the the instructor and student were were.
pushing it back into its parking spot at the end of a flight, and I happened to be out on the ramp and walking by, so I went over to give him a hand. It's a little, you know, a little bit heavy airplane to be moving with the tow bar. So uh, I went over to give him a hand, and, and we both, well, the three of us, the instructor and student and myself, started sort of sniffing and smelling something. And, and what is it? It sounded like, it smelled like cooking something on a grill. And nobody was cooking anything on a grill on that ramp. So I started investigating and got up and um, all of a sudden I saw just a little something that shouldn't have been there under the, in the left engine. So I went and got the screwdriver and we popped the top off the, of the cowl off. And here was a pretty good sized snake sitting on top of the cylinders and cooking away with the heat. And the only thing wow. that we can, we can think of was, um, you know, a, a hawk or an eagle or something had that snake at yeah. altitude and got frightened by the airplane and dropped the snake and it just happened to go right in the in the cow. We, we checked the prop. There was no sign of anything on the prop, so it had to have gone between the prop ways. I don't know how that happened either, but so um, bird strikes and snake strikes. Wow, um, that's a new one to me. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to read this question. It's a fairly long one. Okay. Um, oh, but the first one before that, um, I think, is regarding those tires. It says uh, slashed is in vandalism, but I think you were slashed by a bear claws. Is that correct, uh, Kim? There were two. There was one picture that was damaged by a bear, and then there was the tires that were slashed at Merrill Field. So there were two oh, separate okay. incidents. Vandalism. Yeah, there was a vandalism, and then oh, the bear... Okay, thought it was right. a chew toy. Yeah, okay. Oh, boy. Okay, this one says, I've always been told not to steer away from a large bird on final. They will get out of the way. However, <laughs> I've encountered a bird on short final that was coming directly at me. I believe that if I hadn't taken evasive action, it would have impacted the plane. What are your thoughts on this issue? Well, probably looking for me to address that one from the pilot's point of view. Uh, that's a tough one. We certainly want to avoid any rapid maneuvering while on final approach. We're low, we're slow, we're near the stall speed. As we know, any turn increases the stall speed. Uh, we definitely don't want to stall the airplane we're on final approach. That I guaranteed will not end well. So what's better, hit the bird or take the evasive action? You know, the, I don't think there's a correct answer to that. I think you're, you know, follow your gut at the last moment and see what happens. Just be careful not to stall. But, you know, if the words, if the bird is coming at the windshield, I, I'm not sure that, <laughs> I'm not sure that any of us have the, <laughs> have the hoots, but uh, not take evas evasive action if that bird mm -hmm. is right there with the windshield. But I don't, I'm not sure what we can, what we can do. If it's somewhere else on the airplane, I'd say don't move, let it, you know, let it hit and. Um, Kim will write you a check for the damage to the airplane, yeah. but uh, yeah. if it comes and in the windshield, that's not going to end well, um, you know, either if it comes right through. And from the claim standpoint, uh, the, the question is as far as whether or not we would, you know, create a problem because you didn't take evasive action. Obviously, you want to do what you can to prevent a claim from occurring, but more importantly, you want to keep yourself safe. So if it means letting that bird hit the wing so you can safely finish or finish and land without injuring yourself, then that's the way to go. Yeah, you know, we sure. don't want you, we don't want you out there looking for birds and trying to hit them with your airplane, obviously, but <laughs> we understand that, you know, these things happen, but we want you to walk away and be able to tell us about it. And, and then we do send someone out and make sure we get you taken care of. The um, yeah. And of course the, the claim would be much, much less, just, just talking mm -hmm. dollars, much less for a, a damage to the wing from a bird strike than a stall spin on, on final. So that wouldn't be exactly. Good. All right. Um, okay. I haven't even read all of this, but I'm going to, I'm going to read the rest of it. I'm not sure it's a question or just a statement, but it sounds interesting. When I was in flight school in Beeville, Texas in 1973, I was front seat of a T2. Uh, it's a Cessna 172 military version, and came out of an overcast and hit several Texas turkey vultures. One came through the windscreen, and I had blood and guts all over my helmet, visor, O2 mask. Uh, lucky nothing, nothing down either engine. Oh, that's a, the, the T2 isn't a, isn't a 172. I'm I'm not sure what a T2 is, but anyway, two engines. Yep, um, lucky on that one. Thanks for sharing that, Don. Uh, this one says. Uh, 
Well, this is an insurance question, and if, if you'd rather not answer this one, it's okay, but I'm going to throw it out to you. Okay. It's hard to find insurance with smooth limits, parenthesis, no sublimits, policies. Avemco does write these if Emco does write these policies, why not? I'm not sure I understand that. Is that something you want to... Oh, wait a minute. In the... No, that, that's the end of it. Is that... Do you have enough there to answer I that? I believe so. I think they're asking okay. as to whether or not we write the, the smooth limits. And at this point, we currently are not writing those limits of liability. Uh, we've been doing this for about 60 years. And what we have found is that having that sublimit, meaning your your people are limited to a set amount per person, does make it much uh, more efficient and quick in settling a claim, uh, okay. especially when, multi when multiple people are involved. Um, with a smooth limit, one person could get, let's say, a million. One person could get that million. Well, if you have multiple people injured, each of them is going to want the full million. So that all has to be battled out to determine who gets how much of that million dollars, whereas having a sublimit on it does make it uh, a little bit easier to settle a claim because the most any one person can get is that sublimit of that amount. Ah. Um, and in the past, I can think of maybe two situations where we have not been able to settle within those policy limits that we write. Now, that obviously can't guarantee what the future will be, but, you know, I can only remember two, and I've been doing this for 34 years. She started when she was 12. <laughs> I was two, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> my bad, my bad. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kim. Um, this, one, this one I know is, is right up your alley, Kim. It says, in the intro, you mentioned... Uh, this this qu class, I think, qualifies for an Avemco program. Where can mm -hmm. we find more info about this program? It is available on our website at avemco.com. Or, and wow. sorry, oh um, yeah, this is Marcy Delasio. I'm our marketing director. I'm just stepping in. You can, if you are currently insured with Avemco, mm -hmm. uh, you can send us an email at avemco at avemco.com and say I took any of Jean's um, webinars, and what we do is we apply that as a 5% um, premium credit uh, for your when you come up for renewal, and um, that's just our way of saying we're grateful, and mm -hmm. we, we know that you're being um, proactive in taking training and dual training, but you can find out all the details on abemco.com and click um, look for safety rewards program. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, Kim, would you like me to put your webcam back on? I forgot I turned it off on there where, uh, while we do the this, or would you rather leave sure, it off? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, me. There we go. Oh, there it goes. There we go. All right, there, I'm okay. back. All right, she's <laughs> back. Good, thank you. Okay, this one's a good one. Um, it says, Kim, you mentioned that you see bullet holes frequently. Are they mm -hmm. mostly incurred on the ground or airborne? I would say more of them are, are on the ground, but we have seen airborne ones. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. And we did uh, uh, we did have an interesting case, uh, it's been a couple of years ago, where a husband and wife owned an airplane. There was a, uh, a divorce in process. Uh, they both wanted the airplane. He ended up getting it, and then she came through and actually shot the airplane up. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We had a situation here in Rochester, New York a few years ago. There were numerous general aviation airplanes um, coming back from uh, flights with, with bolt holes in them. Mm -hmm. And there was quite an investigation from a lot of, of people and um, it, it stopped and they never found uh, who was doing it or what was going on. Sure. It was small caliber, but uh, somebody was uh, target practicing on moving targets, I guess. And, yeah. Wow. All right, and this one is related. It says, um, could you say why gunshot damage to rudders uh, is fairly common? I, I assume you meant gunshot damage to airplanes. So, mm -hmm. Do you mean accidental firearm discharge? Uh, there, I, I think we see a little bit of both. I think some of it is accidental where 
it just happened. And I think there's times where they have deliberately shot up airplanes or we're mm. shooting at something else and the airplane just happened to get in the way. <laughs> right. Sometimes people just don't like airplanes going over their houses, I guess. They don't. No. Uh, next, next question is, uh, it just says, where were the tornadoes? Uh, we see those uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, we see a lot of them, you know, in the Midwest, but it is not uncommon to see them in, you know, areas that you wouldn't normally expect them. Uh, I know of one instance of a large claim in Virginia that was a result of a hurricane coming up that rode up the coast, spun a tornado off, and damaged a lot of airplanes. Oh. Mm. Okay. You know what? We have more questions to get through, but before I forget, why don't we do our last poll? Sure. All right. Here it is. How important is it to earn advanced or master level WINGS credit? We're trying to figure out whether uh, registration for this event was so high because um, <laughs> because we gave the extra credit or because uh, uh, you wanted to learn about insurance claims. By the way, we have 915 people um, present at the moment. We had uh, 1,200 and something registered. All right, let's see how we're doing here. 82% have voted, 83%. Give it another minute. No, not a full minute, another few seconds. 85% doesn't seem to be climbing. 86. All right, make a choice. We're going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. And there we go. We'll share the results. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, good to know. Thank you. All right, back to our questions. Um, give me a second here. Uh, okay, this one, I lost my place, we're back. Um, this relates to the weather damage. It says, uh -huh. these are sad photos. What percent of claims are related to on-the-ground weather versus in-flight accidents? I would say most of our weather claims occur while they're on the ground. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, how about fraudulent claims? How many, et cetera? I don't see, think we see very many of those. I may, There may have been one or two that I recall over the last 10 or 15 years. Okay. Um, <laughs> here's, here's one. Uh, does Avemco insure experimental aircraft under construction? If yes, so, we do. is it expensive? <laughs> <laughs> yes, expensive we do. All it's all relative. Exactly. Yeah. To, to find expensive, um, yeah. we do uh, insure airplanes while they are being uh, built, whether it be in your residence or garage or at the airport. Um, you can request a quote at eventco.com online or, or contact us uh, by phone, and we'd be happy to, to discuss this situation. Okay, thank you. Um, this one, this one's maybe a tough one. Are percentages based on counts or insured value? I'm assuming you're talking about accident counts, not insured value, but... We're talking about counts, correct. Yeah, okay, okay. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, what happens to the aircraft that is deemed a total loss? In most cases, we will uh, pay out the claim, and then we retain the salvage, and that gets put out on our salvage bid list. Ah, okay. Thank you. Good. And and in some instances, the owners uh, may choose to buy it back. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, bear with me. I scrolled down too far. I lost where I was. Okay. Um, ah, <laughs> here's a good one. Does a tow bar strike on a moving prop require an engine teardown inspection? And I know the answer to that. If you don't. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what the criteria is, I believe? Uh, other uh, than damage to the prop, if it's sudden engine stoppage, in stoppage, other words, if the yes. engine quits because of it, then, then you've got you to gotta do that. You mm -hmm. know what, though? <laughs> you can, you know, really make sure, if that prop is damaged to a large extent, you really mm -hmm. make sure that that engine 
didn't suffer some damage inside. They, yeah. You can dial it out. I mean, I know teardown is really expensive, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so is an engine, uh, so is a power loss. Um, yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, I represent Zero Tolerance Airport Hazardous Wildlife Management. I have been calling deer. I have been calling deer and other hazardous wildlife for over 20 years in my local field where I learned to fly. At my local field. Anyway. Two years ago, the state of Maryland denied the Maryland DNR the ability to assign uh, crop damage permits, which is how we operated. Consequently, we are limited to the legal season, which is a total waste of time. So, you know, deer do not keep shopkeepers hours. As a matter of fact, right before this webinar, I was honking at a half dozen deer after dark. Mm -hmm. I've been <laughs> no. there and done that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, where, where I am here in uh, western New York, it's a pretty rural area, about uh, about 20 miles west of Rochester, uh, and 60 miles east of Buffalo. It's a pretty rural uh, farming area primarily, uh, fruit farms, apples, pears, cherries, that kind of stuff, some corn and soybeans, things like that. So there's a lot of open field here, and uh, it's just amazing how many... Um, deer strikes my wife has uh with the cars my uh -huh. wife has hit three deers over her driving career uh -huh. living here i have not i tell her that's because i have better vision i think it is because i might be a little luckier but uh -huh. um it, it's kind of, and i i don't know anybody around here who hasn't had a, hasn't struck a deer uh at some point it's, it's just absolutely amazing and they're out there and i have a our our property uh, back of our property is an open field where they alternate between corn and soybeans every year. This year it was soybeans. And the, um, I have a trail camera, and I put that out every night aimed at that field, and it's amazing. Um, I bring it in the morning. My wife and I sit here and look at all the, the, the traffic that's gone through that, that field during the night. Uh -huh. It's just absolutely amazing, uh, the stuff that's out there, and we don't know about it. We had an exciting family of skunks we were watching this summer. Hmm. <laughs> I made sure it was daylight when I put that camera out and got it. Man. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Uh, if um, <laughs> that's what quarantine like. Yeah. Is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this was not to get too far off topic, but this was a, you know, we have a, a a shed in the in the back that you know keep the mowers and things like that in, and um, animals like to burrow underneath that and kind of live under it, and I keep trying to discourage that, but it keeps happening, and. One night I, I put the trail camera just on the hole in the back to see what was going in and out of there, and there were skunks and rabbits going in and out of the same hole. I never, that just didn't seem right somehow, but it was. All right, anyway, far enough off um, off topic. Okay, this one relates to the battery charge. If there, if there is not enough charge to start the plane, stop and charge up the battery. Simple choice. Yep, I, uh -huh. I agree with that. Yep, absolutely. Um, what is your opinion of a battery tender? Ah, would you like me to take that one? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, some people are big fans and some are not. Uh, in terms of the uh, the battery tender itself, I'm a big fan. What I'm not a fan of is uh, leaving battery chargers of any kind of any kind unattended and operating for long periods of time. Um, I've, I'm aware of a number of times when a battery charger caught fire. Uh, you know, not damaged, just just on and operating, and I, I'm a little bit nervous about doing that in a hangar. Now, my son, who is an AMP and an IA, he has a battery tender on his 172 all the time, and, you know, and it's his hangar, and, you know, more power to him. Just just me. I don't, I don't leave any, I don't even leave my phone charger plugged in when I'm not using it. So, uh, we had a battery backup uh, surge protector arrangement on our, uh, when we first got a big screen TV. I said, oh, we can't have any surges on this. And so I put one on it. We caught fire <laughs> in my living room one night. That was Ooh. exciting. It went out into the snowbank. Um, okay. Here's, okay. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. It's very, very long, and I think it's not a question. Okay. Um, bear with me here. Um, uh, sometimes the people in a community hangar, you don't have real control of hangar rash, 
I have a 500-page uh -huh. blue binder from the FAA addressing, oh, no, that goes into a different question. Um, yeah, hangar rash, you know, when somebody else bangs into your, your uh -huh. airplane, that, that's a tough one. I think that's um, that's what the insurance company is there for, right? Am Pretty right much. That's, that we, yeah. we see a lot of those. Yep. Yep, for sure. Um, okay, skipping on down here. Uh, somebody says, do 12-month training and you'll never have an accident? Obviously, we know no. that's not, not true, but we're, no. it's all about lowering the, uh, lowering the percentages here, Correct. flattening the curve is, is the common. <laughs> that's thing. the new norm. That's yeah. The new norm. Right. Okay. Now let's flatten the curve. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we're above average because we were watching your event. I have the advanced phase of wings. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Absolutely. We like to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got time for a couple more here. Um, why does aviation insurance not have deductible? Uh, because typically in aviation, you either don't damage the airplane or you really damage it. It's not like an auto policy where you've got a three or four or $500 deductible, which eliminates a lot of claims. Most of our claims are in the five to 10,000 plus range right off the bat. So putting wow. a two or three hundred dollar deductible on it really doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't accomplish anything. I see. You know, I've wondered about that over the years too. Thank you. Thank you for that. Good. Um, are aircraft coverage rates adjusted due to geographic home location, all other factors being equal? Yeah, they are. If, if you fly in, in different areas of the country and base it at different, uh, in different states, there are rates. Uh, take that into account. Yep. Okay, good. This one says, I haven't received wings pins for years. Am I supposed to request them after I've completed the requirements? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Good answer and, for that and one. And I can, I can talk to that too. When you, um, just so you know, when you get your pins, like Jean said, it takes a couple days for mm -hmm. them to process. And we love the FAA, but they're not very fast sometimes. Um, so it may take us a little bit of delay in getting the list, and we do mail it out. Uh, you will get an email knowing that they will be coming. We send them out on a monthly basis. Uh, so you'll get an email saying, okay, in about two or three weeks, if you haven't received them, please let us know. So we're in contact with you as well. Okay, good. Thank you. And there has um, been a huge uptick in the number of wings pins that have been yeah. sent out since COVID has hit. So. Ah. We're happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's why the numbers are up on our on our webinars. Yeah. <laughs> this one is uh, so. Whatever happened to the plane? The bear was hand propping. Did it survive the encounter? <laughs> yeah, I believe it. It did survive. It needed some repairs, but it did. Uh, it did survive. <laughs> uh. And and I'm pretty sure the bear did too. I think the bear just eventually decided that flying was not his. Uh, his idea of fun, and he decided to go elsewhere. <laughs> Maybe it didn't start on the first swing, and he gave Maybe up. Maybe not. Yeah. And, and he knew enough to walk away. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. He knew, you know what? This battery isn't good. I'm not going to fly this airplane. Yeah. I'll go find another one. <laughs> yeah. Here's a, here's a statement that I'd, I'd like to address. It says, anyone can make a mistake. And that's all it says. And that is absolutely true. We all Correct. do that. But... <laughs> Error reduction is is a science these days, and and that's what I do in my real life these days. I do error reduction programs for high stakes industries, and it is amazing how when we as individuals learn why we make some of the bad decisions we make um, that we don't even realize we're making at the time. It's amazing how we can turn around and, and reduce the number of, of errors that we make. So yes, anyone can make a mistake, but if we take courses and, and pay attention and, and read about accidents and things, we can learn a lot that will help us be better and, and lower the percent. I, have a, I wish I had the, the numbers here in front of me now. I have a thing that I always do on um, a flight 
uh, that has, you know, you're going to make 500 decisions. And if you're right 95% of the time, well, here's how many errors we'll make. And if we can change that to 98% of the time, you know, 99% of the time, how many, it, and that's what it's all about. It's just about bringing the numbers, the numbers down. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. That last statistic correlating time from instruction with landing mm -hmm. accidents, what kind of landing in accidents do you see as claims? What kind of landing accidents do you see as claims? Uh, we see a lot of loss of control, we, and we see a lot of gear up. Hmm. They're, they're very common ones, and a, and a lot of just, you know, losing control, a lot of porpoising, a lot of prop strikes. Uh, in general, yeah. they're, they're the three big, big ones we see. Yeah, it, anybody can go to the um, ASIAS website and daily they post what happened the previous day and on Mondays they post what happened through the weekend. Uh, accidents and in the, incidents that are not always classified correctly at this point, which they are because there isn't a lot of information yet, and they list if there's any fatalities, but they just barely in one sentence, you know, tell what happened. And there is not a day that goes by that there isn't an oh, aircraft landed gear up. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some small percentage of those, there was something wrong and the gear wouldn't come down. Mm -hmm. But that's a very small percentage of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I've done a whole big thing, uh, presentations on, you know, not, not landing different ways, different techniques to make sure you don't land with the gear down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're almost out of time, but I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. When we had our beach duchess, uh, my wife and I, we traveled in it a lot. My wife's not a pilot. And for some reason, she was just terrified that I would forget to put the landing gear down. I guess she sees the things I forget to do around the house. But anyway, she was terrified I would forget to put the landing gear down. Well, that wasn't going to happen because I had a real series of ways to make sure it was heaven. But every time we would, as soon as we started leaving cruise altitude, I'd hear, are the wheels down? And then when we got in the pattern, are the wheels down? <laughs> We're on final. Are the wheels down? So uh, a couple of years ago, I recorded her saying that, and I have it for my ringtone on my on my telephone when she, <laughs> when she calls me. So I'll be in a store, and somebody will, and all of a sudden will be, are the wheels down? And people look at me kind of weird, but <laughs> I know it's her. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's do one more question, then we'll sure. call it a night. We, and, and you know what? We are barely off the top of the list here. So uh, we'll do one more, and then I'm going to tell you now, though, what I'm going to do is send this list uh, of questions. They all come up in the attendance report and the questions mm -hmm. and who asked them and their email address. And I'm going to send it to uh, Kim, and I, you know, I'm not going to promise on her behalf that she'll get through all of them, but um, the ones that, that really need an answer, I think she, uh, mm -hmm. uh, she will for you. And any that are right. pilot-related, she can send them to me, and I, I will take care of that. Um, Oh. Uh, oh, this is a good one, and we'll, we'll end after this one. Do insurance companies support aircraft owners that need to fly out of a hurricane path before it comes? That's a really good question. Um, there are companies that probably do that. We at Avemco don't. And the reason we don't is we want you to take care of your family, your house, and your belongings. And it becomes an issue of where do you move the airplane? I can relate one, one quick story here is I had a customer of mine was based on the uh, west coast of Florida. He moved his airplane because there was a relatively large hurricane coming in and he thought he put it in a safe place. Come to find out the airplane, had it stayed in its current location in Florida, the storm veered off in the last day and missed his airport entirely. The, the storm hit the mountain range, rode up the mountain range, spun a tornado off, and destroyed his airplane that was in his buddy's hangar in Virginia. It was a $300,000 airplane. So the question becomes, where do you move it? Yeah, for sure. You All know, right, you do the you. best you can to secure it. And... That is why you pay the insurance company. That's right. Wow. All right. Uh, thank you, mm -hmm. Kim. Um, thank you. I've switched over to me, and I have both our webcams on at the moment. 
So I uh, will say um, thank you to Kim for a wonderful presentation here, and thank you to Avemco especially for supporting uh, these webinars that we have done uh, in this series. They've been great folks to work with. I can attest to that. So please visit our website, vectorsforsafety.com. There are links to videos and to online courses. Most of those courses are free, and they most of them are valid for WINGS credit. Most of the webinars in this series have been recorded and can be found in the videos section of that site. You can also join our mailing list to receive our free newsletter, Vectors for Safety. Uh, future webinars, uh, you know, they may not be promoted by emails from FAAsafety.gov, so sign up for the newsletter uh, to be sure that you know about them. And please remember, always fly like your life depends on it. On behalf of Vemco, Kim, Marcy, and myself, thank you for attending. Good night.